Hi everyone, my name is Peter. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. I don't really have a song to play right now. Um, how about this? Between now and the end of the video, I'll write a little song and then I'll play it for you at the end of the video. I'm just going to do a little drawing, of course, in the old sketchbook. And here's the pen I'm going to be using. Um, it's a brass pen by Y Studio. You know how I have a penchant for just kind of minimalistic, simple metal pens. I think this is the first one I've had that's like brass like this. It has a, the outer coat is kind of rough. You can see inside this little hole here, how it could be shinier. That the, the cap pops on and off pretty satisfyingly. Some sort of a Schmidt Iridium nib you can see there. Here's where it says, Y Studio, and it came with this whole idea of like a leather strap to put through the this hole with like a wooden case, and you're supposed to carry it around your neck or on a bag or something to to make it portable. That's what it says in the in the in the little booklet that came with it, right? To make it portable. Like I don't know if of any pens I have that aren't portable. Cause watch this. Whoop. That's so much easier than the, the, the portability offered by this wooden case where you have to um, put the, the, the lid in here and then you'd have this leather little leather strop go through here. The two ends of the leather thing go through this little golden ring. Then the idea is that when you're done with it, you put it in here and then it kind of holds itself inside this little wooden case, like so. It's a weird camera angle. I don't know, it's just too much. I like the pen just like this, and I like putting it in my pocket like that, and it is very portable like that, just like all my other pens, so portable. I love it. Wow, Sharpie, so portable. It's just one of those pens that's just, it's just nice to hold. Right? It just feels good in your hands. Like even when I'm not even doing anything, I'm watching TV or something, it's just nice to, to have. It's like a nice weight, it feels good. Also, I'm gonna go ahead and say it, Squarespace is the coolest place to host and design your own website. Now you might have a cool idea or something you're working on that you know needs a website or could really benefit from one, but maybe you don't really know where to start. My favorite thing to do is just to go and start scrolling through all of their really cool templates. Whether you have a podcast you're trying to get started, a portfolio for your art, something for your band, your wedding photography business. They have categories of templates just for what you're trying to do. They all look incredible and you could just roll with them, but then you can also, of course, customize them as much as you want. The only difficult part is making it look bad. So check it out now, go to squarespace.com for your free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Peter draws for 10% off your first website or domain. All right. So I have to make a couple of corrections. Um, say a couple things about what I said in the intro about this pen. I think it's actually a copper pen. I bought the copper one. They also have a, a brass one, the same model. Interestingly enough, the brass one is called a brassing pen. Brassing, and the brass one looks a lot more golden in color, which makes sense because, I mean, that aligns with what I've seen previously in my life. But their brass one, the reason why it's called brassing, is they actually have a coat of black paint on it, which they then, uh, I don't know, they either want you to let the black paint wear off to slowly reveal the golden brass metal underneath, or it says that it even includes a, a sanding paper, which is attached in the product's package. So you can remove the paint on the surface yourself that way, which is interesting. I've never seen a pen where they wanted you to sand the paint off of it. Uh, that, that's what it says under the use and care section. Now, in my defense, under the specs section for both of these pens, the brassing one and the copper one, they both said, for for material, they both say brass, comma, copper. So they both say brass and copper, but maybe they just like 
control C, control V, the materials for each pen. I don't know if it's really, I mean, it seems, it does seem very coppery and I like it still, even if it's not brass. Um, I don't know, is copper too soft, too malleable? I, I don't know. It's still cool, whatever it is, but I also kind of want that brass one. And I kind of want to let the paint wear away on its own. I don't know. Mm. And, and I've also figured out why it's called a portable fountain pen, because their other one, called their their classic model, um, is actually much, much less portable than this one or any pen I own in the sense that uh, its lid is actually a a big base you keep on your desk and you just put the the pen tip down in the base like some sort of uh i don't know like kind of like an inkwell like you just plant it down in there and it just points straight up as it rests there you know what i mean so you can't really take that one anywhere that these both seem like bad designs to me the classic one is bad because I don't know, just get a normal lid. There's no good reason to have a big heavy base that doesn't fit in your pocket and you can't take away from your desk. And this idea of tying your pen to the outside of your bag, it says, Y Studio's portable fountain pen creates a new way to bring your fountain pen with you. You can hang it on your bag and open it to start writing. Wow. I mean, that, I think that's the definition of solving a non-problem, right? I mean, at least to me. Speak up if you're out there saying, uh, you know, you, I personally don't want to ever hang my fountain pens on the outside of my bag. That just seems like it's asking for trouble. I know, for example, that a lot of women's clothing does have a distinct lack of pockets, but if you have a bag to tie it to, at least put it in the bag. Bags are made of pockets. I'm very conflicted because it seems like such... A gimmicky novel idea but I still love the pen because it feels and looks so good and it works really good it writes well all right moving along one of the things I've been doing lately or have always really enjoyed is looking at the past and appreciating the things I've accomplished and one of my favorite things to take stock of are things that I've accomplished by no merit of my own for example tallying up or noting Something as simple as how many days I've been alive because I can um, congratulate myself with a big, large, random number, which I haven't been paying attention to, right? I don't put a tally down for every day I've been alive, but hey, look at me. I'm 11,343 days old. Good job, Peter. Um, another thing I wondered about recently was how far I've traveled in my life. Now, of course, at first glance, you might wonder, you might think, um, of all the road trips I've been on, or even you could tally up all the, you know, all the trips to the, even just to the refrigerator I've been on and add those up and all the airplane flights and just driving back and forth in the grocery store and school and add all those up. But then, of course, you start thinking about other things like, hmm, and we're also inherently traveling in other ways, like the earth is spinning, uh, and of course, how far you travel in that sense depends on where you are on the earth because different parts of the earth are spinning at different speeds. I think the circumference of the earth, also known as the equator, is just over 20 or actually I think it's just under 25,000 miles. And of course, that any point on there spins around once per day. So that's just over a thousand miles per hour that it's spinning. Um, but I'm somewhere farther up, um, away from the equator. And so I don't know exactly how fast I've been spinning for most of my life here in the middle of America somewhere. Maybe it's closer to like 700 miles an hour or something, but then you just keep on thinking bigger and bigger picture. Like oh, th then the earth is also spinning around the sun at like 67,000 miles per hour. And the sun is also spinning around the center of the Milky Way, our, our galaxy, at almost 500,000 miles per hour. And the Milky Way is moving too. But I mean, I feel like the farther out you start going, the less movement starts to mean. Also, look, I don't understand all of this, but the I thought there was a big bang. And I was reading about this, and it says that we're going to collide with 
the Andromeda galaxy, the closest galaxy to us, in about 4 billion years. But I thought everything was spreading out. So did the stuff spread out and then start heading back together again? We're, we're rushing towards the Andromeda galaxy at 70 miles per second, according to an al- uh, article I was reading. Anyway, so everything's moving very fast, and I have made incredible progress over the course of my life. Even just taking into account the movement of our solar system through space, I've I've traveled over 120 billion miles. So I would consider myself well-traveled. And then you might wonder, hey, what if our universe is actually, I don't know, can, can a universe be inside something if the universe is everything? But maybe, what if the universe actually is a simulation inside some other more powerful something, like a computer or a, the mind of some more powerful being, right? If that's the case, then you, is it like an exponential movement? All the movement here is also moving inside, uh, like if there's some computer that's calculating all of us, that is also moving in its world. That's like two level, two levels of mo- movement. We get to multiply all of that. Anyways, going back, before I started thinking about all this extra level of spatial and parallel universe movement and everything, I started thinking about how if you're moving a thousand miles per hour at the Earth's equator, that's past the speed of sound. And if, and if you're moving, if you're standing at the North Pole or the South Pole, according to just angular moment or, you know, the spinning, the spinning of the Earth, whatever, angular you know, centripetal acceleration, whatever it's called, if you stand, stand right at the, the tip of, or the bottom of the Earth, you'd be moving at zero miles per hour. So if you walk straight from the one of the poles to the equator, there would be some point at which you crossed the speed of sound according to how fast you're moving. But I started to wonder why people around there don't randomly have sonic uh, like booms or whatever uh, as they walk across their yard or something. But then I did a, a, just a very tiny amount of research and I realized that the speed of sound and, and sonic booms and breaking the sound barrier and all that. Of course, it's speed and all of this is all relative. And sonic booms and stuff have way more to do with movement through the air. And if you're there on the surface of the Earth moving 800 miles per hour, it doesn't feel like you're moving 800 miles per hour, of course, because all the air around you is also moving that same speed. But there have been people who have crossed the sound barrier just as a person. For example, that that Baumgartner guy who who was up on that Red Bull balloon and jumped and he did a free fall for like 24 miles and it only took him like four minutes. Apparently he got up to like 800 miles an hour or something. I don't remember the exact number. Apparently he crossed the sound barrier. And I started thinking about those Concorde planes and how those were invented in the 70s. Every now and then when I think about those, I get really sad because it used to have these these pamphlets that I would flip through when I was little with all these different planes on them, different, all the different specs. And, and I was like, the Concorde, it looks so cool. Why don't we have those anymore? Like we used to have supersonic passenger airliners and then we don't anymore. It's like we, we hit the, the apex, the apogee of, of, of aviation. And then we receded again, right? Like, why don't we have that? Well, it turns out that we are still making moves. For example, there's the Lockheed Martin. It's called the X-59 Quest, which stands for Quiet Supersonic Technology. Um, they're, they're, they're making, they're, they're trying to figure out ways, basically. The, the main problem with the Concorde and the one other um, supersonic passenger airliner that ever went into production was the, um, the Tupolev, is that what it's called? Tupolev TU-144. The problem with those seemed to be that they were just too loud. Also, every now and then they would crash. But like, for example, this Lockheed Martin X-59 Quest, that they're trying to, um, it's called a LBFD, Low Boom Flight Demonstrator. They're trying to figure out a way to, to fly at supersonic speeds where it has a low 
uh, it, it only creates a slight thump, like the sound of a car door. That's only as loud as it is, right? And I used to think that when some when an airplane flew over the speed of sound, it was it was like a pop, a boom. The 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 sonic boom would happen as they crossed that barrier, and it's usually like seven hundred, seven hundred something miles per hour, but that's at certain conditions, right? 767 miles per hour in dry air at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you go up to like five miles into the air, it can be it can be way colder and the air properties can be totally different. And sometimes you only have to go like 680 miles per hour. So it can really, if, it really depends on what the air is like around you, right? But it's, it really, the sonic boom it happens the whole time the airplane is flying. It's because there's this there's shock wave of like compressed and and decompressed air following the, this cone shaped shock wave following the supersonic airplane as it flies through the air, and it creates it, it creates a this path on the ground after after it goes by of incredibly loud noise. It pretty much just drags behind it a very loud noise wherever it goes, and even when it's even it seems like even when the the planes are very high, um, it still causes a problem. So like the Concords, um, they, they were restricted to flying back and forth over the Atlantic pretty much um, from places like in like Heathrow in London and Charles de Gaulle Airport, John F Kennedy Airport in New York. Apparently. To develop the Concorde, it costs like four billion dollars, and then uh, they only ended up making like twenty of the jets, which were split between Britain and France, and the the government had to just eat all the price, eat all the the costs because it costs like way way more than they expected. They 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 only expected it to cost like four hundred million. It cost ten times as much. Um, and then they the, apparently the, the French said that they were losing money on these jets the whole time. Brit, Britain said that maybe they were making money. They claimed they were. F- France just kept on running these airplanes as a matter of public pride because they were so cool. And the tickets for these, I mean, it's I I guess how maybe they could have been making money because the ticket for, from 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 London to New York and back would cost thirteen thousand dollars of modern. Uh, U.S. dollars. That's expensive. It would take less than half the time of a normal flight, but $13,000? That's a little pricey. Anyways, um, in 2000, I think it was, one of the Concorde jets crashed as it was taking off because another plane in front of it that had been taking off, uh, a DC-10, a little piece of metal fell off of its um, jet engine. Mm, It wasn't a jet engine. A little piece of metal fell off of it and then it hit the wheel of the Concorde jet as it, as it was taking off and it flew into an engine and they were going too fast. They hit, you know, that special point where we're like, we're going too fast. We can't abort the the takeoff. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. And then the whole thing turned into this flying ball of flame as certain engines burst into flames and uh, the landing gear was stuck down, which caused a problem. And there's a video on YouTube where, some guy driving by just films this Concorde. It's just kind of barely crawling through the sky. And it eventually, like 10 miles away, plopped onto the ground on top of some hotel. And some of the people uh, in the hotel died. And everyone on the on the Concorde jet died, like, like 100 people. Mostly Germans um, who are on their way to uh, New York for a cruise. And I'm just trying to figure out how nice that cruise must have been if you're willing to pay $13,000 just to get to the cruise. Oh, anyways, rest in peace, all of them. Interestingly enough, that that Concorde jet crashed just um, like five miles away from where, like 27 years earlier, at the Paris Air Show, the Tupolev Tu-144 um, the only other ever production supersonic airliner crashed. And that was that started to seal the fate of the Tupolev Tu-144. Thankfully, there was only crew on that one, but it killed eight people on the ground also. 
um, air, air shells are pretty dangerous, I think, because you're just standing around right underneath um, weird, experimental, and sometimes outdated airplanes doing crazy things. Sometimes they fall out of the sky. Anyway, so when that Concorde crashed, it kind of helped seal the deal for for Concords. There, it was ex too expensive, too loud, and then people started not feeling comfortable with them after it crashed. Even though, you know, this is also around the same time, shortly after that, 9-11 happened. Um, the whole airline industry as, as a whole started struggling. And uh, I mean, but this Concorde that crashed it had, it had completed over, I think, close to 5,000 takeoff and landings. It was like 20 years old. It had like 13,000 flight hours. So, I mean, I don't know. It's not like, for some reason, I felt like these were like fragile, fragile things that barely sit, stayed in the air. But before this, they, I think they had like a reputation as being some of the most, the, the safest airplanes. But maybe that's all due to marketing. I don't know. Anyways, I hope Sonic Airliners come back just because it's it's cool. It just fe feels weird that we had it and then we lost it. But uh, people were just too upset about uh, the how loud they were, the the the, the shock waves over over residential areas. Anyways, um, that was the Wikipedia hole I went into earlier today. So, all right, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> song I wrote for y'all, for me. June bugs fly into July. July heat blows into August. What do you know about butterflies? Which little bugs are the most dishonest? Yeah, I spent my whole life here in this little cocoon If you ever see me, it'll be by the light of the moon Yeah, I spent my whole life here in this little cocoon No, I don't think I'll ever be coming out soon a day It makes my brain feel okay I'm looking online to see what they say The mighty all omnipotent all knowing information super highway Yeah I spent my whole life here in this little cocoon if you ever see me, it'll be by the light of the moon. Yeah, I spent my whole life here in this little cocoon. No, I don't think I'll ever be coming out soon. recording.